All right, well, good morning, everyone. You'll see me talking to a mic, but you'll hear no um, amplification because this is just for the recording. So uh, change of plans, I'll be passing this down for each of you to answer. So when you're speaking, try and use the mic so that your answers are recorded and can be put online. Um, thanks for coming out. And this is a, a mayor candidate forum. So there's an election coming up in November. Um, there are sheets, there were sheets at the front that are just strictly informational about Boulder City Council. And just briefly, there's nine members of Boulder City Council and a majority are up every two years for election so that each two years the voters get to choose the composition of council. For the first time this year, mayors elected separately from the rest of council and will be done by ranked choice voting. So there's a little bit of instructions on the sheet about how to fill out a ranked choice ballot. This will be the first ranked choice election in Colorado that I'm aware of. And so this is new and groundbreaking for everyone. There's also information about how to check your voter registration and so on on the sheet. So grab one. Um, they're good, helpful information about the election that's coming up. All voting will be by mail. So in Colorado, and particularly in Boulder, Boulder County, everything is done by mail. So your ballot will arrive uh, at your house or your apartment. You just check to make sure that you're registered here if you've moved in the past year or two. Um, but if you're registered, you will get a ballot at the registration address. You fill it out and return it by mail where you can drop it at a voter service center or if any of this is confusing, you can go to one of the many county service centers and vote in person if you'd like to. And we have same day registration in Colorado. So if you live here, voting here is super easy, especially if you check your registration ahead of time. So for today, um, we are going to be asking four set piece questions that the candidates have seen before. Um, a couple of them have even answered them before. And uh, so I wanna, we're gonna start with introductions from each of the um, candidates. There will be three minutes each. So for each of these questions, every candidate will get three minutes. We'll have a timer. Dory's timing and she'll show 30 seconds. When there's 30 seconds left, please limit your answers to three minutes. I'll wave and shout if you're not, but um, sometimes people get involved in their answer and forget that there's a time limit. So three minutes a piece and we will start, first question we'll start with Paul because he's next to me and I can give him the microphone first. First question will go down the line. Second question will start with Nicole, go down the line and so on. So we'll just shift who's the first respondent to each question. And then after that, um, so after the first two questions, we're gonna do a little rebuttal or additional point break where people can say something they've heard that they wanted to respond to. We'll do that at the end of the second question and then we'll take audience questions. So at the very end, we'll ask two or so audience questions and there are um, index cards and pens. So we'd love to have them written down so that I can get them right and we can get the question recorded on the um, tape as well. So with that, I think we're ready to get going. We're gonna start with you, Paul. So I would like you to please tell us what your favorite flavor of ice cream is and why, that's the important part, and then tell us about yourself as a candidate and why we should vote for you as mayor. Three minutes, go. Thanks, Anne. Uh, first of all, thank you for the Boulder Newcomers Club uh, for hosting this meeting today. I had to Google it this morning. It was like, uh, who are these guys? And Mark was telling me that uh, what, it's between like, it's, it's for Boulder newcomers. But I was thinking, surely after three or five years, then everyone has to get kicked out the club. Is that how it works? That's a tough club. Anyway, my name is Paul Tweedley. Uh, I've lived in 4th Street, uh, 4th and Alpine, for 20 years. I've got uh, one son who recently graduated from CU. Go Buffs. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Scotland, uh, I've spent my career as a software engineer, uh, designing, developing 3D design, simulation, and uh, manufacturing systems for mostly the aerospace industry. Uh, why am I running for Boulder? Uh, Boulder Mayor? That's a good question. It's like, probably the same reason as these guys, you know, I want to make a difference. I don't think I've got much more to add than that. Apart from, I saw that ice cream question there, right? And it's like, I've not had an ice cream in like over a year. I mean, who here's not had an ice cream in over a year? Just me. All right. Don't vote for me because obviously there's something wrong with my head. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm. Um, 
It is. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So I still just need to need to speak loudly. All right. I will project. Please let me know in the back if you can't hear me well. Um, I do have a, a relatively quiet voice. So if I start getting quiet, please let me know. Um, I'm going to start with the most important thing. My favorite ice cream is Boston cream pie, which you can find periodically at one of the sweet cows in town. It is hands down the best ice cream I have ever had. It's delicious. Beautiful combination of vanilla, chocolate, all the flavors. So it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, so I'm Dr. Nicole Spear. I am a mom to two high school students um, who thankfully made it off to school this morning <laughs> as I was rushing over here. Uh, I'm also a cognitive neuroscientist and I work part time at CU Boulder where I manage a diverse team of researchers and technologists, data scientists and students. Um, we do neuroscience research for um, scientists across the front range as well as for some folks in the local biotech, biotech industry. Um, I'm also a union member and I am a current city councilwoman um, and I'm running to be Boulder's first elected mayor. Uh, serving on Boulder Council for the last two years or so has really been an honor um, for me. I have enjoyed especially working with my colleagues to seat a more diverse group of leaders on our boards and commissions and to strengthen local democracy by moving our um, city council elections to even years when we have about 17,000 more people voting on local issues. I've supported increased funding for flood and fire mitigation and initiatives like Cool Boulder. And if you don't know about Cool Boulder, I encourage you to go check it out. Um, it's one that's working to make sure our city will be resilient and uh, be able to weather, no pun intended, uh, the coming climate changes where we're going to be heading toward a hotter and drier climate. I've been a consistent champion for our city's racial equity goals and for workers, ranchers, and low-income members of our community because I know that in the same way that biodiversity is critical for the health and well-being of our ecosystems, diversity in our human uh, teams and relationships is also critical for the health and well-being of our community. As a scientist, you'll find me always advocating for using data and facts to inform our decisions, especially around the growing issues of homelessness that are impacting all of us and housing affordability. I've been especially vocal about the importance of more evidence-based solutions and support services for individuals who are experiencing homelessness, particularly unsheltered homelessness for more economic assistance and higher wages for low-income workers to prevent homelessness and more resources for people experiencing mental illness and substance use disorders, especially our youth who are seeing skyrocketing rates. So over the last two years, I have acquired the knowledge that I need of how our city works, the relationships, uh, both at the regional level and here locally, with staff, with community to really um, make a difference for our city. And what I'm hoping to do is use my science background, my leadership background, to help us make faster and more efficient progress on some of the biggest challenges our city's facing. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful be to be here with you today. My name is Aaron Brockett, and I am currently your mayor here in the city of Boulder. Um, I started my career on public life uh, with five years on the planning board, where I served with Sam for several of those years, uh, followed by two terms on city council, including several years with Sam over here. Um, we, we've been working together for a long time. And then the last two years as, as the mayor here in time. And in that time, we've accomplished some really amazing things. Uh, for example, we passed an assault weapons ban, not once, but twice. And we have the strongest local gun control measures of any city in the state of Colorado. We protected our immigrant communities with sanctuary city ordinances. We've created hundreds and hundreds of units of permanently affordable housing for people of low and moderate incomes. We've created over 130 units of permanent supportive housing for people experiencing homelessness to get them off the streets and into safe housing where they have wraparound services to uh, make sure that they're safe and healthy. And we've made progress on transportation issues. Uh, we actually have gotten some good funding news just in the last few weeks. Uh, just a few weeks ago, we got a $25 million grant to do a bus rapid transit pro um, program from Boulder to Longmont, including a regional grade separated bikeway, and that completes that funding stack. And that'll be done in the next two to three years. So that's super exciting. We also just got a $4 million grant from the Denver Regional Council of Governments. Uh, I served on that body for six years. Nicole's serving on it right now. $4 million uh, to do protected bike infrastructure over on Colorado Avenue in the 30th Street to um, the campus area. So making progress on safety and transportation and all of these things. But we've got a long way to go still. We have a lot of big problems. We'll, keep, we'll talk about those in, in terms of this forum. There's a lot to talk about. 
But I will say that um, the reason why I'm running for mayor is to um, continue the work that we've been doing so far. So in my last, in my eight years on council and my two years as mayor, I built the regional relationships with other elected bodies, other municipalities, state legislators, the mayor of Denver, um, our Congress people, because when we work on our common problems together, we make more progress. And I've been out in the community each and every day, uh, going to events, supporting nonprofits, knocking on doors, talking to people in the community, and figuring out how we can work together to solve our problem, common problems. So I've been an all-in mayor. Um, I do everything that I can to support the community, and I would will continue to do that work each and every day if you'll support me for re-election. And then to address the most important issue of our time, I'm gonna talk about my favorite ice cream flavor. So as a lactose intolerant person, my options get a little bit limited, but I love a good coconut ice cream. No fancy flavors, just a beautiful, delicious, cold coconut ice cream. And uh, have eaten that within the last year, um, I can confess to. So thanks for having us today. Look forward to the conversation. Take care. My favorite flavor of ice cream is Rocky Road. It has chocolate, it has marshmallows, it has nuts. I like all those things in one bowl. It doesn't get any better than that. I'm running for mayor because I believe that leadership matters. I'm a lawyer by training. I'm originally from Omaha, Nebraska, although I did root for the Buffs last weekend. Um, and um, about 12 years ago, I retired from practice of law uh, so I could devote all of my time to, in service to the community. I've, I've been in a number of leadership roles here in Boulder, including at the Museum of Boulder, at Chautauqua, at the Dairy, the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, Conference on World Affairs, and another number of other organizations. You can read my bio on my website, bobyatesboulder.com. The city council consists of nine people, but the last two years have been rather uncomfortable for me because um, I find myself in a three-person min minority. Oftentimes, council votes go six to three, and I'm on the losing end of several of those. I want to visit with you very briefly about some of the votes um, that I lost um, to the majority. Um, I believe that over the last two years, our public safety here in Boulder has degraded. I think it's a less safe city than it was two years ago. A, a few weeks ago, a majority on council voted to increase the occupancy limit of unrelated people in apartments here in Boulder, even though the voters had a different conclusion two years before. A few months ago, the majority in council voted to give away local control on land use decisions to the state. Fortunately, the bill that they supported did not pass, but I suspect it will come again next year. Number four, we have a police oversight committee, which oversees our police department and provides them with guidance on proper policing. Unfortunately, the council majority appointed someone to that police oversight panel who was inappropriate. They were reprimanded by our lawyers, and they had to remove that person. And finally, the council majority advocated successfully for a $19 million property tax increase. So you'll all be paying that property tax as you pay your bills here. So those are just some examples of some of the things that the council majority has done over the last couple of years that I disagree with. And we'll talk about some of those here in a few minutes. I've served on council for the last eight years. I listen to you. I communicate with you. Many of you receive my monthly newsletter. Thank you for reading. And I pledge that if I continue on council as your mayor, I will continue to listen. I will continue to communicate. Thank you very much. Quick. All right, so the next couple of questions are going to be on homelessness. And before we dive into uh, response from candidates, I want to set a baseline of information that are, I think is just factual information. And I think it's all relevant to understanding the answers that you'll hear from these folks. So um, when I got on council in 2013, we had the Boulder Shelter for the Homeless, and our quantitative understanding of the homelessness problem was the point-in-time count that happened every year and the number of people that slept at the shelter every night. That was really unsatisfying when you're trying to address this problem. So in 2017, the city of Boulder launched a coordinated entry program for homeless services that linked all of the city and the um, service providers are nonprofits who help us with the homelessness issue. And this coordinated entry program was then adopted in 2018 by Homeless Services for Boulder County. So now we have a far better understanding of how many people we serve, how long they've been in the city. We know when they spend nights at the shelter and whether they've uh, accessed services or through the court. So I just wanted to say that that was an important step that's been made in the last handful of years. And then another thing is from the 
2023 point in time count, which was held in January, which is a one-time snapshot of people who are unsheltered, there were 839 individuals counted as homeless in Boulder County, 240 of them unsheltered, meaning living on the street or in a car. <laughs> Family and youth in the point in time sh uh, were 30% in this 2023 count, but typically it's between 30 and 40% of the people are in families. And it's important to remember when we talk about the homelessness problem, people who are unsheltered, it is many of them are families who you won't necessarily see in public spaces. They're living in cars or they're couch surfing or they're taking advantage of one of the safe houses around. And so it's very important to realize that when we talk about these counts, a good 40% of them involve children in one way or another in a family. Um, and then uh, of those, 58% of the unsheltered identify as male, so it's somewhat preponderance of males, 40% as female, and 2% as transgender or nonconforming. In the past, estimates have been made, and there's a bit of a hand wave, but I think it's mostly true, that two-thirds of the homeless population are centered around the city of Boulder. So the predominant impacts and the predominant issues are here in the, in the city. The City of Boulder staff, the Be There staff, or their partners, perform about 1,700 outreach contacts every year, covering about 530 unique individuals. So there are folks out as part of the city, the police department, and partners who are reaching out to folks. And of those contacts, more than 500 have resulted in some action to move towards housing. 950 formerly homeless individuals have been placed into long-term housing through City of Boulder programs since October of 2017. This is a victory that we should be very happy that we know about and can count because it's quantified successes that we can learn from. And on average, that's three successful rehousings per week over the last six years. So, and then there's many more programs which are involved. So that's just a little context to, you know, the situation that these folks will be stepping into. So here's the question. Many parties advocate additional homeless services for the city to provide, including managed tent encampments, safe drug use sites, mobile sanitation facilities, day shelter services, and more. And directly to the candidates first to Unicol. What are your views on the city plans to locate a day services shelter on Folsom Avenue, as well as your views on what the most useful addition to city services for the homeless would be coupled with that? No. Thank you. You did the last Thanks. I appreciate the context too, Sam. Um, I think it's so important for us to recognize that homelessness, you know, we sometimes talk about it as a small, small H issue of just what we see on the street. Um, it really is this much bigger context. Last year in Boulder Valley Schools, there were over 800 children that experienced homelessness with their families. Um, and I just want to address uh, some of the things that I sometimes hear around who is unsheltered on our streets. Really encourage you all to go and check out Metro Denver Homeless Initiative, which does the seven county regional coordination on homelessness um, across the Denver metro region. They have some excellent resources, data, studies that show up there. Of course, as a scientist, I love data. So one of the things I just want to share out is that of the people who um, they recently surveyed who are experiencing homelessness, 87% had a last permanent address in Colorado. These are Coloradans who are experiencing homelessness here in our community predominantly. Um, so I, I wanted to address that. Um, the number, the other thing that I want to address is the issue of housing. Housing is the primary cause of homelessness. And you can look anywhere in the country and as housing prices go up, homelessness rates also go up. These are facts, this is science, you can go and, and, and look at it. Um, on my website, I have a three-page document that is resourced with all kinds of studies and things like that that you can go and find um, and look at some of those things. So in terms of what it is that we do, there actually are evidence-based solutions to ending homelessness, ending homelessness. Um, Houston is a place that started doing some of these things about 10 years ago. Over the last 10 years, even though they started out as the sixth highest homelessness rate in the country, they have decreased homelessness by 63%. It is solvable. There are things we can do. There is an approach that our county is use, using that is in conjunction with the Metro Denver Homeless Initiative called Built for Zero. Although homelessness as a whole increased by over 30% last year, 
Veteran homelessness, which is the one population we're implementing the Built for Zero model with, decreased by over 30%. This model works. We can, we can do it. <laughs> with, with this model, we can end homelessness in time. Um, the other thing that we really need to be focused on and investing money into is prevention. Ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, we know that one-time cash payments to people who are just about to slip into homelessness can prevent homelessness for up to two years, probably more. There is research about this as well. So by focusing on prevention um, and by focusing on evidence-based solutions to ending homelessness like permanent supportive housing, uh, which Denver has done a lot of in the last five years, they've seen reductions in crime and jail time along with that because we know that if we get people housed and if we provide them with the services that they need to stay housed, we actually can reduce crime rates. We can end homelessness. So I will talk about this a little bit more um, in my next response but I think my time is up. Thank you. Yeah, well, and Sam, thanks so much for providing that context. It's good to start with some facts. And this is, I'd say, the toughest issue that we work on on the local level. You know, homelessness has been rising, and you heard the facts and figures behind that right now, but you can see it on a human level just by walking out the door over here and seeing the unsheltered folks uh, over by the creek. And so we need substantial new additional resources and solutions in this area. Um, and so we've, this is an across the board kind of solution that we need. Uh, the day services center was the specific question. I very much support that concept. Currently, we don't have a place for people who are experiencing homelessness to go during the day. And so the library becomes a de facto day shelter, but there are no services here. And, and sometimes people are struggling with one issue or another that can have impact on patrons. So everyone is welcome at the library, but it's not, it's not a day services center. So I'm very excited that we're working on standing up that day services center so people have a place to go to get out of the cold or the heat depending on the season and then take a step on next step on their journey to getting housed whether that's you know might just be a shower or a haircut or getting a birth certificate so they can apply for disability benefits and so we'll have wraparound services there so very much looking forward to getting that open but that by itself will not solve homelessness we need a lot of additional solutions Fortunately, we have a big new funding stream coming online. Um, Proposition 123 was passed at the state level last year. I don't know, are people familiar with the 123 that passed last year? It's actually, it uh, takes some additional tax revenue from the state and devotes it to housing and homelessness solutions. So we're gonna get millions and millions of dollars of additional revenue uh, right now that we can point towards these solutions. So for example, um, Denver right now is really working hard on uh, micro communities, which is um, like a tiny home village or a safe outdoor space with really high quality tents with heaters and shared bathroom and kitchen facilities. And so they have this ambitious goal of getting a thousand people off the streets by the end of the year. This is the uh, Mayor Mike Johnston's administration. So these are solutions that we're working on regionally that we can implement here as well. Um, but as, as Nicole mentioned, permanent supportive housing is a critical piece of this as, as well. So get, obviously the fundamental answer to homelessness is housing. And so we've got a new project opening on 30th Street just in the next uh, few months that'll have spaces for 35 more people. And we're working with some private um, and nonprofit partners to implement more of those housing solutions as well. But it is very, um, we have to be uh, cognizant of the fact that a lot of folks are experiencing significant mental health and substance abuse challenges as well. So that needs to be a piece of this puzzle too, is uh, more resources in that area. So we're working with the county um, to partner with them to add uh, group homes uh, for substance abuse recovery. And we also need some more transitional housing with better and more intensive mental health and substance abuse uh, interventions. So by working on all of these solutions, plus the uh, prevention that we were talking about as well of rental assistance, we can make um, a real significant progress on this problem. We do need to work on this all working together. It is one of our biggest problems that we face here locally. Thank you. Let me mention two C's when it comes to homelessness. Compassion and community values. We need to be compassionate to those people who find themselves homeless. We also have to honor our community values, and those are not incompatible. In my newsletter last week, I laid out eight things to address, eight problems we have relating to homelessness. Some of them focus on compassion, and some of them focus on community values. One is permanent supportive housing, has already been mentioned. We need to, to house people, not only in apartments, but also with support from a social worker who can help them with their particular uh, uh, circumstance, whether that's mental health or substance abuse. 
Second, we do need to partner with the county and the, and the state, which have health departments, unlike the city, to expand mental health treatment and substance abuse treatment. Number three, and these are all in my newsletter and on my website, there's eight of them. Number three, we have to um, make better use of our night shelter. Do you realize that on an average night in Boulder, Colorado, there are 33 empty beds in our shelter? Our shelter is only used at 80% capacity. Many of the people you see out here camping are not camping because they turned away at the shelter, they're camping because they choose to. Number five, we do need to open a day shelter because nine hours a day, people are not allowed to stay in the private night shelter. We want to have places for people to be and to seek services other than hanging out at the library or the band shell or the creek. Number six, um, number, excuse me, number five, we do need to enforce our camping ban. This is community value when, when people camp in our public parks that excludes you all from using that space. Number six, we need to clean up those spaces when people do violate the law. Um, uh, a year ago, we expanded our cleanup crew, we doubled our cleanup crew. Some people on council voted against that. Um, I was fully supportive of that. And if the cleanup crew needs more resources to continue to clean up our, our, our parks, we will uh, do that, I will do that. Number seven, this is very provocative. Crime needs to have consequences. We have, pe have people who are committing crimes who are not suffering the consequences. We need to ensure that our police are supported, that our prosecutors are doing their jobs, and that our judge is enforcing the law. And finally, number eight, transience. I was speaking to Yvonne on the way in here, and we talked about probably the number one challenge we face is transience. And while uh, a number of people who are um, living here and camping here in Boulder may be from Colorado, only 49% of them have lived here for longer than one month. 49% have, have been in Boulder for one month or, 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 or more. That means half of the people are, are flowing in and out, in and out of Boulder. Our city staff estimates that on average, four new homeless people show up every day. and They replace four people who leave every day. The average time spent in Boulder is 1.3 months. People often come here, they commit crimes, they do drugs, they camp in our creek, and they move on to the next town. Our two biggest pipelines are Longmont and Denver. So while they may be from Colorado, they're not from Boulder. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. All right. Paul. Mayor Paul. Thank you. Paul, question, what are your views on the day service for the shelter in Folsom and what the day services are for? Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you, Bob. I think that's important that we distinguish. What do we mean by the homeless problem? And uh, Bob, he specifically sort of separated out you know, the transient problem. Because that's what most people think when you see the homeless problem. I mean, these stats that uh, Sam's reading about the city program, they're fantastic. But what are people worried about in Boulder right now? It's not that, oh, there's six people being housed every, every month, fantastic. No, they're worried about the crime. They're worried about the drugs. They're worried about the illegal encampments. They're worried about a CU student being stabbed there. So I think we do need to, it's funny, I was uh, speaking to uh, the city council there, they were having an orientation meeting, and the, the, the department head uh, in charge of housing, he was describing this problem, and I said, well, why don't we just call them transits? Because, you know, your jurisdiction is just like housing actual homeless from Boulder or Boulder County. Whereas, you know, the transit problem is more a, you know, it's a, it's a police jurisdiction, really, to enforce the law. And he was agreeing, he said, but in 2018, there was a decision that the term transient might hurt people's feelings. Well, I think we've got to come up with a term. If you don't like transient, how about uh, unwelcome, unwelcome before we solve it? Uh, you're talking about uh, the day service. I want to answer that in Folsom. No, I'm against that. And what about additional services, like additional mental health services? No, I'm not for that either. I don't think there's a problem that we need to throw money at right now. We need to enforce the existing laws, because if you build it, they will come. I mean, I can just see if, you know, eh, there's a new city pro eh, program, and, and some guy calls up his buddy in Austin there, which is like, you know, it's a shithole. Sorry to use that language, but I mean, it, it's got human feces all over it. We don't want to become like like Austin. But he's calling up his buddy in Austin saying, get the gang over here, because it's like they're giving out free phones, and I'm going to get a free Tesla. No. No, it'd be tough in crime, and I'm sorry. You can't stay here. That's the message I would give. We enforce our existing laws, and I don't care where you go, 
but you can't stay here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Paul. All right. So the next question, we'll start with you, Aaron. <clears throat> and uh, for the next question, a little background. Tent encampments routinely arise in the city, populated by unsheltered individuals in violation of the camping ordinance governing public spaces in Boulder. These encampments are periodically removed by the city in conjunction with property storage and assistance at accessing support services. So Aaron, question. What are your views on the city approach to managing illegal encampments on city property, including your thoughts on the Safe Zone for Kids ballot initiative? Three minutes, Aaron. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, just to be clear, we have a variety of city programs. None of them are giving away free Teslas. Just, just in case you were, you were <laughs> um, no. But the, this is, of course, this is a very difficult issue with uh, illegal encampments. Uh, it's a problem that that grew significantly worse during COVID, and I think it is important that we do not allow uh, illegal encampments to stay in public spaces. Uh, if you allow an encampment wherever people happen to set them up, then we do lose access to the broader population. So for example, if, a, if a, uh, an encampment gets set up on a playground, that means that it's impossible for, for kids and their families to play on that playground. So I think it is important to say no public spaces are not for living in. And so we do have these uh, cleanup crews and which we did add additional resources for those uh, earlier this year and have made some progress on this problem. Obviously there's still encampments going on because people don't have other places to go. So to be clear, this does not solve homelessness. So we have to undertake the additional solutions that I was speaking about uh, in answer to the previous question, while at the same time saying, hey, public spaces are not for, for camping. And um, I was, so we, the, uh, to address the safe, uh, safe zones for kids issue, this is a ballot measure right now that would prioritize encampment enforcement around schools and within 50 feet of multi-use paths and 50 feet of sidewalks. And uh, personally, I think it is not a good approach in policy because we already highly prioritize schools. The area around Boulder High is our highest prioritization for cleanups in the city. But 50 feet within all sidewalks and multi-use paths is actually a good percentage of the city, maybe 40 or 50 percent of the city. So it would actually dilute our current uh, strong focus on working on the areas around schools to include much of the rest of the city. And not only would it dilute around schools, is that if we did have a problematic encampment that, didn't, that wasn't near a school or a multi-use path or sidewalk, say behind a rec center, for example, we'd never be able to get to it because we're, we'd be so busy with the encampments that are near the sidewalks and multi-use paths. So while it's well-intentioned, I think we can all agree that we should focus around safety for our kids and around schools. The specific approach to this one, I think, is poor public policy. I'd recommend a no vote. But um, we will continue to, I think we can promise and be cl very clear that we'll continue to focus uh, with about zones around schools for these enforcement efforts. Thank you. Remember I said about homelessness, there's the two C's, compassion and community values. So let me talk a little bit more about community values. Our responsibility as city government is to protect you, to, to maintain public safety. Our most vulnerable residents are our children. They're required to go to school. They're required to walk to school. They're required to be at school. And we often have encampments, tents, needles, exploding propane tanks, and other highly inappropriate behavior happening near our schools, particularly Boulder High School. And so a group of parents got together and it put a, a petition to put a measure on the ballot, safe zones for kids, to prioritize the cleanup around our schools. I fully support that ballot measure. We need to protect our children. It's inappropriate for a 14-year-old girl or a 16-year-old boy to be exposed to these types of things. I hope you will join me in voting yes on safe zone for kids. As you heard from Aaron and I think you heard from Nicole, they're opposed to that ballot measure. That's certainly their prerogative. I hope you, you take a very close look at that, that uh, ballot measure and decide if, if we should make our priority protecting our children, our most vulnerable residents. Thank you. Yeah, Bob, well said. Uh, our kids are our most important resource. And it just seems like a no-brainer to me. Why would we not protect the school zones or, uh, uh, around our schools? It's like... But no, yeah, I agree with Aaron. I mean, what's the point of passing a ballot if we're going to, like, you know, say we're going to protect school zones and police are going to have additional authority if nothing ever happens? Because we've, we've already got existing laws in the books. And, you know, 
whether it's like, you know, the police aren't allowed to do their job or the courts just let them go. It's like, whatever we're doing right now is not working. And it has to work. Because kids are the most important thing, as we all agree. Uh, so I, I would uh, say a couple of things. Visitors must respect our laws. If you break the law, it's a misdemeanor, you get a ticket. If you don't pay your ticket, you're going to jail. And, and I think it's up to sort of city council uh, to set the tone here. I mean, uh, as team captains, I was uh, speaking at city council there through the week in the, the police uh, initiative, and I was challenging the uh, city council to uh, set the tone. Set the tone is a kind of sporting term. I used to play soccer back in the day, and uh, I was telling these guys, uh, it's so much fun, but I'm too old now. But I played a sweeper uh, position there at the uh, Pleasant View Fields, and VTS, he was the team captain. I said, one day, we shared the same role, we'd switch in and out as we get tired. And he'd say, uh, Vitas said to me, do you want me to, do you want to take the first in? And I said, no Vitas, you're the team captain, it's up to you to set the tone for the entire team. So I think City Council has got an important job here to set the tone for the entire city. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Um, so I think of uh, all the candidates running for mayor, I've got the youngest kids, mine are 13 and 16. Uh, both are in high school. So uh, this is absolutely an issue for me. Um, mine get around using their bikes, riding the bus. Uh, my youngest, when they were 12, uh, had somebody masturbating right near them on a bus. Uh, came home and told me about that situation, was a little bit uh, concerned <laughs> about what, what he had experienced. Um, so I very much um, see the issues and I'm very, very motivated to end them. And I would like to follow science and evidence-based solutions to end them. So I just want to um, dispel a couple of myths uh, around what we're currently doing. So we do enforce encampments. We started in uh, 2021. Um, we enforced encampment sweeps with a program that was uh, spending between one and two million dollars a year on cleaning up encampments for this next budget. We are looking at increasing that to um, over $4 million. So if it's working, why is it getting worse? Why, why, why is we're spending more money? Is the issue just getting worse? Um, we can look at the science. We can see that encampment sweeps do not stop homelessness. They do not re uh, reduce crime. They actually disrupt people's connections to services. And yet we're spending more and more money every year on this quote unquote solution. Uh, the other thing I want to address is the magnet theory of homelessness. So this is a regional issue. We do have movement across the region, but most folks flock to urban centers. Um, when they experience homelessness, that's where the jobs are. That's where they typically are when they fall into homelessness in the first place. So it is a regional issue. We need some regional solutions. What Denver is doing um, is a good start because that is where the largest population of people who are experiencing homelessness is. So as they um, start to invest more resources there, that ought to relieve some of the pressure um, on everyone else. But um, I, I really would love to see us stop putting money into things that we know from our own experience and the science says do not work when there are evidence-based solutions that do. Um, so I do not support the Safe Zones measure uh, because we are already doing that. We already prioritize schools. Um, it is not going to change anything about what we do, but what I worry about and the reason I'm against it is that it's going to give us a false sense that we are doing something that works when it does not. Um, and focusing more attention on encampment cleanups, which are proven to not work, to not reduce encampments, to not reduce crime, I worry for our kids, frankly, um, and, and for all of us. So for me, it is not um, this, this is an issue where by focusing on solutions, we are going to get more safety for our children. Um, the other thing that I wanted to address is just kind of drawing the analogy back to climate. We ignored climate scientists for decades, and now the problem is much bigger, much more expensive, putting all of us at much more risk than if we had paid attention to scientists 30 or 40 years ago and started to take measures then to reduce the impact that our emissions were having on our climate. It is a similar issue with homelessness. Thank you. So thanks for those answers, complex question, good answers. Um, I did want to, at the request of Boulder Newcomers, we're gonna do something I told you about, which is each of you can have one minute 
to either point out something you didn't think was accurate in another answer or just to add to what you've already said in the context of what you've heard from other folks. So just one minute, how you'd like to close on homelessness, and then we'll move on to a short break, and then we'll talk about growth and development. Bob, it's going to be your minute to start with. Thanks, Sam. Well, I don't think I need a rebuttal. I think it's, it's probably become pretty clear to everyone in this room in just in the first two questions, the differences between the candidates. Um, I, don't, I, don't, um, I don't have any rebuttal for my colleagues. I just disagree with them. I've been disagreeing with them for the last two years. And if I'm fortunate enough to be uh, uh, elected to council again, I'm going to stand my ground on these issues. I think they're very, very important. So I don't have a rebuttal to them. I just, I just say that I stand where I am, and they stand where they do. And you'll make your decision at the ballot box on who you think is the best leader for Boulder. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with Bob. It's a, uh, but you know, it's not just Bob's opinion or my opinion or anybody's opinion. Look at the progressive cities, councils of Austin, Portland, Oregon, San Francisco, Seattle. What's happening to their cities with their progressive city councils? Yeah, we don't want to follow the, that path because we've seen what happens. They never, they've always got the same answers. We need more money. It's your fault. It's climate change. It's somebody's fault. But you know, yeah. Anyway, that's not working and we need some new ideas and we need them fast because lives depend on it. Thank you. I um, just have a couple couple thoughts I want to um, address. One is I, I really hope that we can kind of stop dividing ourselves into these buckets, progressive, conservative, Republican, Democrat. It doesn't help us get to solutions. We need all kinds of different perspectives to solve these problems, and we need everybody to be able to come to the table, share their opinions, and really get to the heart of some of the solutions. Um, I just want to address one more thing, which is around uh, the, the idea of sort of transience and movement across the front range. I'm sure you know you all, as Boulder newcomers, <laughs> will recognize that there are a lot of people here who did not start out in Boulder, who did not start out in Colorado. If you look at the rates of um, who is here that's from outside of Colorado and compare them among housed and unhoused people, there are actually more housed people here who are not from Colorado than there are unhoused people. And I think that's just important to keep in mind. It is not saying that anybody is bad or shouldn't be here or anything like this, but we have to figure out how we can kind of all work together um, as we move forward. It is the only way we're gonna solve all these big issues. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll just make a pitch here for working collaboratively to solve these incredibly tough issues, right? Homelessness is as, is as hard as it gets in our local community and across our region and across our nation, right? And so rather than talking about an us versus them approach, we need to all come together. We have different perspectives. That's important. We don't want everyone on council to be thinking the same way. Not everyone in our community feels the same way. But we all bring our best ideas to the table. We have a dialogue. We collaborate. We work with the community. We work with our nonprofits. We work with our regional partners. We find the best path forward to take our limited resources, help people who are struggling, and make real progress on these very tough issues. Thank you. Cool. And um, so now we're going to take a short break. I don't know how needed it is, but the last couple times it's been requested. So we'll take a short break and mingle with the candidates. They're here. They have a busy, busy life. They're going to be in another whirlwind. I don't know what they have next, but there will be something. But this is a good chance to talk to them. And if you got something on your mind, let them know. Thank you, candidates. Let's be back here in 10 minutes at 1030, ready to go with the next two questions. We're ready. So this question, I believe, starts with you, Bob, right? We've got one, two, three. You did the rebuttal. We'll start with Paul. All right, Paul, so this question will be to you. Three minutes. Lack of affordable housing is shown to increase local homelessness and create income inequality in communities. The city of Boulder, in alliance with Boulder Housing Partners, which is our HUD housing authority, it's the partner that helps the most in building and managing affordable housing in the city. So the city, with Boulder Housing Partners, manages 4,000 units of affordable housing out of our 45,000 units in Boulder. So that's about 8.3% of the housing units in Boulder are permanently affordable to people making um, middle income or less. And the city's stated goal, and, and that, by the way, those 4,000 units house 8,700 people in Boulder out of our 
um, 100,000 population. So that's about 8.3% of our housing units that are designated as permanently affordable to low-income folks. The city stated goals 15% of Boulder's housing to be permanently affordable. And so the question to you, Paul, and all the candidates, do you agree with the goal of 15% affordable housing? Why or why not? Do you think we're moving fast enough towards it? And if not, how would you accelerate funding for it? Yeah, that's a tough question. Yeah, I, we need affordable housing here in Boulder. Otherwise, we're going to end up with Vail or a Telluride, where it's just like, a, a, like you know, the, building these million-dollar McMansions. I was just uh, talking there, and it's just like there's a lot of pressure on these desirable places. But like in Telluride, I was speaking to a guy there, and he was saying, now the billionaires are forcing out the millionaires. No. We don't want that to happen to our beautiful town. So yeah, we need to like have some affordable housing. We need to be careful though, because it's like, you know, it's a bit of a racket when you think of it, you know? It's like the developers, you know, and a lot of these guys are out of state, and you know, what, do you think they care about our beautiful town? No, it's all about the bottom line, just getting the money. And yeah, they put up some of these ugly, you know, unsightly boxes. And it's just like, you know, who wants to live next to that? It's just like, who wants to live in it? It's kind of soul destroying. So you know, the planning department has to do a better job of like, you know, come on, keep this town beautiful. Uh, anything else? Also, like, you know, even the people who live in the affordable uh, housing, yeah, I, I, was, I was speaking to a lady and she said she's paying $1,600 $1, a month for like, you know, it's a one bedroom little box apartment. And, you know, isn't that affordable? No. And people who buy the affordable ones, it's also a kind of a racket for them because, you know, they're hoping, well, if I can get it outside this covenant or this deed that is supposed to keep it affordable, well, then I could sell it for twice the value. So we have to be very careful. It's a very difficult question and very good question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do agree with the goal. Uh, I do not think we are moving fast enough. And um, unfortunately, I think the time to accelerate progress was 20 or 30 years ago. <laughs> um, we are in a state right now where we do not have enough affordable housing for the people who are here. Um, while costs are going up and wages have remained relatively stagnant uh, for a lot of folks. So this is kind of why, why we are in this housing affordability crisis. Um, I think, you know, um, my colleague was mentioning uh, some of the ways that we've disagreed on this council, but we've actually agreed um, almost unanimously many, many, many times on issues of housing and affordable housing in particular, which has been a really wonderful thing to see. And so we've made a lot of progress that I'm sure um, they will speak to as well uh, in things like um, some zoning changes, um, some code changes that we are making to create an environment that will lead to more affordability in the next 10 to 20 years. What research shows is that many of the changes that we are making does not necessarily change affordability right now, overnight, but it will slow the rate of increase over the coming decades, and that is important too, because again, focusing on prevention can be a much more effective way of addressing these big challenges than if we're trying to treat them after the fact. Um, one of the things that we talked about last at our meeting last week that I'm really excited about is getting more money for our affordable housing program by starting to uh, charge for major additions or expansions of single family homes. This is not something that we have typically taken money for, um, even though in my neighborhood in South Boulder, I have seen so many what were you know maybe 1,500, 2,000 square feet single family homes expanded, doubled, um, increasing the cost of that home, increasing the cost of surrounding homes and the value as well. So some of these things I think we can do that it's, it's a nice incentive. It's letting people know, yes, yes, you can build a large home if you want to, if that is what's going to serve your needs. And 
we are recognizing that that comes at a cost to the community, taking money from, um, from those kinds of expansions and putting it into more affordable housing. I think that is a, a good way for us to make some progress there. Um, one of the things that we can do to address affordability right now is not so much in building new homes overnight um, that likely are not gonna be all that affordable, uh, but really thinking about how are we supporting basic needs for people in our community who are struggling with housing, with healthcare, and with childcare, which are the three expenses that have just skyrocketed in the last six to seven years that more and more families are struggling to afford. Um, so that is a way that we can make immediate progress. Uh, we can also raise the minimum wage, which I think all of us on council are uh, mostly supportive and which we'll be working toward hopefully next year. As we raise wages, we're not just putting the burden on housing to bear the cost of affordability. Thank you. Great, thanks for this. And first of all, I have to say, uh, Sam, when you were mayor, you would have never given us a 10 minute break after one hour of meeting. <laughs> I think you're, you're getting soft in your, your retirement. <clears throat> um, but thanks for this question. Yeah, the affordable housing is one of the most important priorities that we work on here at the local level in the city of Boulder. And I absolutely do support the goal. I'm actually proud to have been uh, on city council when we raised our goal from 10% to 15% a few years ago. Uh, because it's critically important that we find that affordable housing for people who need it. And um, I see this uh, in my own life. So I live in the Holiday neighborhood at the north edge of town, and that, that neighborhood has over 40% of deed-restricted affordable housing in it, and it's sprinkled in throughout the neighborhood. So the neighbor just across the way from me is a, an employee of the city of Boulder who could never afford to live here. She works part-time uh, doing a couple of jobs. Across the street from me is a, a great guy, uh, Mike, who used to be on the streets experiencing homelessness and has lived in an apartment across the street from me for the last six years, uh, is no longer unhoused. And you see that when we talk about there are 8,700 people living in affordable housing, those are 8,700 lives that have been transformed by these opportunities. So we gotta keep working on doing more. And uh, in Boulder, where we get the most progress out of this is from our inclusionary housing program. So 25% of all new construction is required to be deed restricted affordable. I'm also proud uh, to have been on council when we raised that requirement from 20 to 25% a few years ago. And either it goes on site or there's a cash in lieu payment where we actually are able to realize even more affordable housing in other places. And we're able to do things like in the new 30th and Pearl development, there's uh, housing, affordable housing for people with disability, uh, developmental disabilities, who's the first housing of that kind in our city. So we're able to support people with a really wide variety of backgrounds who've historically been left behind in our community. So I think we can get access to some additional affordable housing. Part of it is uh, by allowing housing in places where we don't currently. So right now in East Boulder, in all the big um, business parks and industrial parks, no housing has been allowed there for decades, forever. There's literally no housing in that segment of our community. But we're working on rezonings to allow those to move and evolve into vibrant, uh, mixed-use, walkable, bikeable neighborhoods that include a good chunk of housing, much of which will be affordable. And so there's a big opportunity. We're gonna talk about a couple others here in the next question. And then I'm gonna mention again the Proposition 123 funding because that actually is bringing millions of dollars in additional funding every single year that we can put towards our affordable housing programs, right? So by transitioning some of our business parks and some of our aging strip malls and such into these mixed use districts, that gets us access to a lot more places for people to live who currently are driving maybe 60 miles to get here and give them more time with their families and a more sustainable way to live. Thank you. Well, I won't need three minutes for this answer, so I'm gonna take a few seconds to introduce my wife, Katie. Um, like me, she, she, we, we moved here together 22 years ago, so we're not newcomers anymore. Um, and this summer we celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary. Yeah. Um, and although I have, um, as of this morning, 827 people who have endorsed my candidacy for mayor, um, my number one fan is my wife. <laughs> and, and she always tells me what I'm doing wrong, which is what, what every candidate needs. Um, yes, I support our goals. I, I, as, as, as was Aaron, I, um, 
I was on council that increased our goal from 10%. Our goal for about 20 years was 10%. We moved the goalposts on ourselves uh, to 15%, and that was a good decision. We're almost to 10% now, and, and we're trying to get to, to 15%. Um, I, the, um, Sam mentioned Boulder Housing Partners, which is our housing authority, which, which generates much of the affordable housing you heard Sam talk about. I served for three years on the board of Boulder Housing Partners, so I know firsthand what it takes to create affordable housing, especially for our low-income families. We're doing pretty well for low-income families. We're not doing so well for middle-income families. Our housing prices in Boulder continue to go up, and while, while there are special federal and state subsidies for low-income families, if you make above a certain amount of money, they're just not available to you. So one of the things that Sam and I put together a few years ago when we served together on council was a middle-income down payment assistance program where we loan money to middle-income families to help them with that first down payment. It's an interest-free loan for up to 15 years for that down payment so that these young families can afford to live in Boulder. These are often families that work in Boulder but can't afford to live here. That program was approved by the voters overwhelmingly, and I'm proud to say that the program launched last month. And so if you have kids or, or grandkids or other people that you know who are struggling to make that first down payment um, towards their middle income housing, please do um, see me or, or reach out to the city staff and they can help them qualify for that program. So thank you very much. These guys are hitting it out of the park with good, crisp answers, so much appreciated. The next question, land acquisition and land costs are at the heart of housing affordability challenges in Boulder and worldwide. In addition to increasing density on current city land to increase housing availability, there are two major blocks of land which could be developed with an intense focus on affordable housing, the Boulder Airport and the Boulder Planning Reserve, which is about 600 acres. Each of these two sites has groundwork to accomplish before they can be considered in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan update, which is coming to this next council. So whoever of this group is elected mayor will oversee the 10-year update of our development plan for Boulder, which is called the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan, which has a lot to it, and it will be coming to this next council. So. Um, the, the, um, there is time, so I'm going to give you a brief uh, one-minute thing on the comp plan. The comp plan is called the Land Use Bible of the City of Boulder. It's a joint agreement between the city and the county, Boulder County, which limits the boundary that Boulder can grow to. So it's voluntary on both parties, but it is the start of the planning in Boulder County for where the city centers will be and where the unincorporated county will be. And so within that comp plan, Years and years ago, we designated an area north of Boulder, which is on the other side of Highway 36. If you took Broadway north and you just drove straight through that light and hit the field, that's right in the middle of the planning reserve. The city owns about half the land and private parties own about half the land. And when this comp plan update comes, any private owner can come to the city and say, I want you to annex me part of the Boulder Valley comp plan and you have to consider my request. That is a requirement. And so there will certainly be a request from some landowner, I bet I can name them, in North Boulder who wants that land annex. So that's the context for this question. The airport is a question that has landed in the, the council because council wants to ask about it and the um, question of the planning reserve is gonna land in council's lap because it's scheduled to do so. So here we go. Here's a question, we're gonna start with who, Nicole. Uh, would you like to see either the airport or the planning reserve advance in time for the 2025 comp plan update and how would you like to see these mo major land blocks become part of Boulder's housing, if at all? Thank you very much. Um, so the short answer is yes, and the longer answer is that I think we need to talk about what advancement means. <laughs> so as you noted, Sam, um, the planning reserve, this was, when did you all do that? It was early 2000s, wasn't it? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. And so decades ago, we identified this area as a place that may be helpful for um, future development. We are just now on this council, put it as a work plan priority, getting to a point where we are looking at what kinds of urban services are needed up there. Um, water, utilities, those roads, transportation, that sort of thing, um, in order to move forward with some type of development at some point in the future. So this process is not something that takes three to five years when we're talking about what 
what it means to um, advance for the comp plan we're really talking about. Are we wanting to move in a direction of thinking about these things and starting to do some of the work that is going to be necessary? Um, I think yes, because I think that our housing issues are only going to get worse, particularly with the climate crisis in the coming decades. Um, this isn't something that I am likely to be alive for, uh, but in the next 50 to 100 years, we will see places in this world um, in, on our continents becoming uninhabitable to human life. And so where do people go when that happens, when the land that they are on can no longer sustain them, due in large part to the way that wealthy countries like ours have burned fossil fuels and created this climate crisis. And so for me, it is a moral obligation to be looking at how our city is going to be able to sustain some of these influxes of climate refugees. Um, of We're already seeing economic and social refugees coming even from places within our own country. I was talking to somebody the other day whose house in Florida has been hit by a hurricane twice. He has given up on trying to rebuild it. He is moving here. Um, so we will be seeing more and more people like that. And in order to make our our, uh, what are, our future, future councils, future, for future community members' lives a little bit easier. We really need to be thinking now about taking some of these very initial steps toward the decades-long work that it's going to take to get um, more housing. I would really like us to be thoughtful about how we're approaching some of what a future community might look like in both of these different areas. Uh, we need to be thinking about how we're preventing desertification of some of these lands and areas that are all around us in our open space. Um, we need to be thinking about how people are going to get water. What kind of shelter can we be building? How are we planning for fire mitigation and flood mitigation? How are we planning for a future where the economy is going to have to be more local? because we will not be able to get things from all over the world and use them at the rates that we are using now. Um, so for me, this is a climate issue. Uh, for me, this is a moral issue. We really need to be working toward um, what we want these places to be in 50 or 100 years right now. Thank you. Yeah, I think these are both really intriguing opportunities. Uh, let's talk about the airport first. So there are important uses out of the airport for commercial and scientific and life safety uh, efforts that run out of that. But on the other hand, it could become a really amazing new neighborhood uh, with a big chunk of affordable housing and places for people to live and shop and things like that. Uh, we're very constrained though by our obligations to, to the FAA. So uh, it's unclear that we would be legally able to decommission that as an airport or that it would come at a price that we could afford. So I think for my priority for this next year is to say, okay, let's really dig into those details and say, is this a feasible possibility? And if it is, then let's look at it. And if it's not, let's take it off the table and focus on other things. So I supported that in our council retreat a couple years ago, and we'll do so again at the next retreat if I am reelected. In terms of the planning reserve, uh, this is something that has been, as mentioned, uh, uh, looked at for decades as a possible kind of final place for the expansion of, of Boulder um, to meet an, an important community need that can't be met uh, otherwise. And I think in this comprehensive plan update, we should look very closely at whether now is the time to go ahead and uh, allow that, make that eligible for annexation. This is actually my neighborhood. Um, the planning reserve is two blocks from my house, a section of it. Um, and I'm very open to seeing it, uh, exploring that possibility. As Sam mentioned, the city actually owns about half of that land. So the opportunities there for new neighborhoods um, with a, a very high percentage of affordable housing is, is really, really exciting. So it's, we, we have to do the urban services study to make sure that we have the water and the sewer and the other resources uh, to accommodate that. But this is something that I'm really looking forward to evaluating very closely in the next comprehensive plan because I think it could make a real difference in terms of the housing needs and moving us towards a kind of a complete community overall. So looking forward to that. Thank you. So I've written, oh, you don't need to repeat the question, I got it. Um, I've written about both the municipal airport, which by the way is the oldest municipal airport in the state of Colorado. Um, Charles Lindbergh landed on a dirt field there in 1923, exactly 100 years ago. And it's been our municipal airport since 1934. So it's, it's something we're all really proud of. And there's a whole lot of reasons to keep that airport open. I wrote about the airport a, a few issues back in my newsletter, and some of you probably read that. And uh, for a whole lot of reasons, uh, the airport serves a lot of purposes, plus, According to our contract with the FAA, we couldn't close it any earlier than 2042. Now do the math and think how old are you going to be in 2042? 
it's not going to happen, and it shouldn't happen. But let's focus on the planning reserve, which I did actually write about in this month's issue of my, my I think it was issue number 84, monthly issue number 84 of my newsletter, about the planning reserve, because I do think that there's a lot of potential there. Um, imagine Gun Barrel Part 2. It's a, it's a different part of town. It's northeast of town, but it could be a, a complete comprehensive community, just like Gun Barrel is, with its own roads and streets and, and, and plumbing sewers and fire stations and libraries. Um, should we do that? Possibly. I think it's going to involve an interesting community conversation. Some people are worried about traffic and the expansion and growth of Boulder, so I think it's not something that we're going to do automatically, but it's something that we're, we're starting a conversation about. And as Sam mentioned, as we update the comprehensive plan next year and the year after, this is something that will spawn a community conversation. Should we create Gun Barrel 2 in this, what is called the Area 3 Planning Reserve? Right now, it's a giant prairie dog field. Uh, and so there's nothing out there really to remove other than the prairie dogs, which we'll be kind about. Um, and the question is, should we expand the city up to the northeast or not? And that's something that all of you will have an opportunity to, to participate in and discuss. Some of you may think it's a good idea. Some may think it's a bad idea. But it's a conversation that we'll have over the next two years. Thank you very much. I didn't know that about the airport. <laughs> That's a great airport. I know a few pilots that, are, uh, that like it out there. And uh, as far as uh, grabbing the airport's land, no. no. It's just a knee-jerk reaction from, you know. But as I was actually speaking, there's all kinds of problems, and, you know. Uh, I was speaking to the airport manager there, and he gave me the impression that, no, he's not worried that the city's going to steal the airport. So I'm pleased about that. You know, Aaron was talking about rezoning parts of East Polar. That's a knee-jerk no from me again. Increased density? Need you no. Why? Why am I so tough? <laughs> uh, I was reading in the paper, well, it wasn't in the paper, but it was on Reddit. I guess it's a, it's a plan to develop the area around about the dark horse. And I don't know if they, it's in Williams Village there along in Baseline. And I don't know if you know the dark horse. It's simply the best place to go for a beer and a burger, and it has been in Boulder for like 50 years, and they're talking about tearing all that down, and that Italian restaurant that's next to it, and building up, you know, I think it's like a CU, want some more dormitories around there. And that's another knee-jerk, no. We need to stop these things, you know, that are just ripping our history apart, our unique history in Boulder, so that CU can build more dorms. No, if you want to build more dorms, you know, I'm a CU fan, but if you want to build more uh, dorms, you use your own land out there. Don't be grabbing any more of the cities. Did that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for the set piece question answers. Um, we'll take one minute. If there's anything you heard from other candidates or just something that you want to elaborate on, go ahead and, and do that. So take one minute, talk about growth and development, what you see in Boulder, and then we'll move to audience questions. Nicole, we'll start with you. All right, thank you. Um, I was just going to address some of the things around the airport. Uh, I really am interested in exploring this as an alternative uh, site for some point in the future. Um, one of the things that I tend to look at when I'm making decisions is uh, who is benefiting and who is being harmed. And um, some of the communities that are over by the airport that are dealing with all the noise and the pollution that's coming from the leaded fuel, they're being harmed by what is going on there and some of the practices. Um, it is the city land. It is the city land. And there's some, um, we're, you know, as, as uh, some of my colleagues mentioned, we are moving forward with trying to understand some of the legal issues. But some of the estimates, even from a couple of years ago, are that we could decide what, how to zone that land and then um, sell just a third of it off. And that would cover our obligation um, to the FAA. So we'll see as we get more information about it. But I don't think it's something to um, discount because uh, if we've got almost $350 million of land in that space, and just a handful, uh, 100 or 200 people are benefiting from it. Um, I think it's good to rethink that. I, I want to hear your questions, so I'll cede my time. I'll just say briefly that you know um, I, I've done a lot of candidate forums in this room over the over the years. I've served on a council for eight years, and if we were having this session, I think we did have this session two or four years ago, the primary focus would be around growth and development. How big should Boulder be? Should we add housing, so on and so forth? It's interesting that now in 2023. We're not having a whole lot of discussion about growth and development. It's still very, very important. It's all about public safety, right? Because I think that's, that is the existential problem in our community right now. And focus on public safety and get us back to the place where we were a few years ago so we can resume those community discussions around growth and development. Uh, 
Yeah, we've been kind of ignoring the elephant in the room. And that is, what about these buffs? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, the, the, the TCU game, it was just like, you know, before uh, the, the game, it was like, I'd have been happy with a 500 season. But then after the TCU game and that one against Nebraska, no, my expectations are present. I want to win the Pac-12 and then we'll see where we go from there. One thing I did read in the paper was that uh, Boulder brought in $17 million out to the retailers, just what the out town fans, the students coming out, going out there. And I don't know whether they're paying Coach Prime, but I can tell you it's not enough. <laughs> I, I will point out that the last forum was Friday before the Nebraska game. And I brought in the t-shirt I bought after 2001 that said Nebraska 36, CU 62. And that, that uh, margin of defeat over Nebraska, I think might be the biggest one ever, but if not, it goes back many years. Coach Prime's game, if they had managed to stop the last drive, they would have surpassed the margin of victory of the 2001, what was called Bedlam and Boulder event. So it's a good year for the buffs and it's a good year for the Boulder restaurants that live off of the buffs. So two thumbs up. I want to ask a, a question that I didn't ask last time from the audience because I didn't fully understand it, but I know who asked it. So I'm gonna ask it, and if there's any more refinement to the way I ask it, you let me know, okay? So this is about historic districts. And currently, there are 10 historic districts in Boulder. What's your thought about the possibility of a civic historic district? The way I interpret that is you mean the civic center area by the band shell being designated as a historic district. Okay, so. So that's the question, and let's see, who do we start with now? Aaron, I think. So Aaron, two minutes or less if you want. What do you think about a Civic Center designated historic district? Yeah, thanks for this question. <clears throat> I know how hard you've worked on historic issues in town, so thanks for that. Um, yeah, I think this is an exciting possibility. We uh, took this up, I think it's about been about a year ago now, uh, is in the question of another um, uh, looking at the possibility of landmarking the band shell and we said well let's take a step back and let's look at landmarking our entire civic area district here because there is such a rich history in our downtown uh, around the the libraries and the the band shell and the o original olmstead plan for um, the city's green spaces and so i'm excited about this it's taken a little longer than we had hoped the parks department is trying to make sure that we have a good inventory of exactly what's here so that we can incorporate all the details into the district but this is, it, it's such a rich area that I think it's uh, a really exciting opportunity to, to landmark the entire thing. And that'll still allow for some changes. For example, we have two aging city office buildings over here that are in terrible shape. They're ugly buildings, they're in the floodplain. They're probably gonna need to come down before too long, but that'll still be allowed with this. And I think it'll, it, we can preserve what we have while still evolving the area into something that's even more beautiful and functional. So thanks for that. Thanks for the question. I am a history geek. I um, studied uh, American history in graduate school. Uh, I served for four years as chairman of the board, board of the Boulder History Museum. I love history. I love Boulder history. I am fully supportive of creating a historic district downtown. Many of the buildings that are in the, the area are already landmarked. The tea house, uh, the building where Bamoka is, the, uh, the atrium building, which is that kind of square building on the corner that used to be a bank the band shell. And so we've got a lot of it already designated, and so why not throw in the rest of it? Um, there's no uh, businesses or houses that would be affected, and I am very, very positive about creating a historic district in that end of downtown so that we make sure that we preserve every little bit of it for future generations. Yeah, I agree with what Bob said. Yeah, just to add on to that, I mean, I live up in the uh, Fort and Alpine, and uh, we were talking there. I love historic districts, uh, like, you know, we we'll talk about Mapleton, and they've got these massive houses, but, you know, Maxwell is really nice as well, because they've got lovely all, and if you've been to, like, Georgetown, uh, that's another example of beautifully preserved, these minor houses, yeah, we, we need to hang on to our history, uh, just a little anecdote, uh, so, you know, the, uh, it might, you know, 1903 or something like that, just a beautiful house with additions that have been put on, and, Hey, Lori, get this idea that it'd be a good idea to make all of these uh, houses because you know I think there was one 
they're two in that row that have been replaced with modern houses, but she wanted to preserve the other ones. So she went round the neighbours and asked them, and they, it, and it went to the, the, you know, the preservation, the history department uh, at the city there. And uh, because the neighbours input, unfortunately, I think, well, you know, we, we didn't get to make it historical. Because you, you, you do have to listen to the people who are going to be affected by it. And it's like, because it's going to affect your resale and what you can sort of do. So, yeah, you have to listen to the community as well as the history board. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, the possibility of a civic uh, historic district. I am very uh, interested in this possibility. And one of the things that I especially like to try to understand about our history is how are we bringing many different perspectives into history? So with a project like this one, I would really love to understand um, what some of the uh, indigenous communities whose lands we are on um, you know, feel would be a good way to address the history of this area. Um, I would really like to understand how some of our black community members and the Latino community feels about this area too, because this area, especially along the creek, um, I think for so many people in Boulder have not been here for 40 plus years. And if you talk to people who have been here for 40 plus years, they will tell you that the area along the creek has always been a place <laughs> of encampments. And it sort of comes in waves, you know, and goes. So how are we using um, uh, setting up a historic district to um, educate and understand the past and, and what has gone on previously? Um, I am very, uh, I think it is spot on the um, saying that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Um, and I, I would love to see how we can use this, um, this process as a way of creating more inclusion in the city, more accurate representation of our city's history, really bringing in um, a lot of different perspectives. And um, how are we in the process of creating this designation, also using it as an opportunity to repair some of these um, harms that people are experiencing. Uh, I was at an event with some indigenous folks at a, a farm um, a month or two ago, and it, there, there is a visceral, hurt that people feel who whose ancestors are native to this land, knowing that they cannot even afford to have their own housing and their own land here. It is a harm that has been caused. And so as we look at something like this, um, I really hope that we can be very inclusive in our vision um, so that we can undo some of those past harms and think about a better way to move forward. Thank you. And I'll just remind everyone that a harm that was done to the community was having a town gas factory right next to where the Dushanbe Tea House is now because that has polluted that whole area. We've done extensive remediation as the city, but there's a lot of history that doesn't get featured that's interesting when you dig into it in that specific area as well. I'm gonna do one quick thing. I'm gonna answer a question that is a factual answer. So I only got one of these this time. Uh, and none last time, what are the reasons for not allowing ADUs? I think it should be said that ADUs, are ADUs accessory dwelling units, mother-in-law houses, carriage houses, alley houses, whatever you want to call them, are allowed in every residential zone district in the city. So that was changed iteratively by everyone up here. So ADUs are allowed everywhere. The size and parking have some questions, but they're allowed in every zone district. With that, I would like to turn to a question um, that was asked, and we will start with, where are we at now? Bob. Okay, Bob, here's the question. Any type of growth induces broad impacts into the city, its infrastructure services, and institutions. How do you offset the costs of these impacts against the desire to encourage development and provide more housing? Two minutes, Bob. Boulder's population growth rate has actually been very low and very slow, and I've, I'm actually happy with that. Over the last 20 years, our population increase has been 0.6%. That's six-tenths of 1%. Compare that to some of the cities around Boulder, where their growth rates are 2 3 4% per year. And so that grows pretty quickly, pretty exponentially. I'm happy with our slow growth rate. It strikes a balance between creating new housing opportunities for low-income, middle-income people who want to live here. And during my eight years on council, we've created a 1,000 units of low-income housing alone. However, we don't want to grow too fast because that creates a lot of consequences around water, around traffic, around our ability to provide public and human services. And so we're trying to strike a balance here between being welcoming 
and inclusive to, to newcomers who want to come to Boulder and live here and enjoy all the benefits of Boulder, but also not changing Boulder character so dramatically and so drastically that we wake up one day and find out this was not the Boulder I moved to. Right? And, and so that's a very difficult task. This is one of the most difficult challenges that people on city council face is how do we strike that balance to try to be welcoming and inclusive but also not change the city so dramatically that um, we are uncomfortable with how it looks. Yeah, I don't really have a desire to encourage development. I realize that, you know, we need it. But, you know, my desire is to attract families and retain the ones that we already have. I was hiking up there, Dakota Rizzler, there, I met a lady, and she's lived in Boulder all her life. And she says, but there's no way I can retire here because, you know, I can't afford the, the property taxes. Yeah, and that's a shame. And we've been making it harder and harder, but you know, they, they talk about families, they, they move to the L's, which is, you know, Lyons, Longmont, Lafayette, Louisville, because, you know, families can't afford to stay here eh, on, on, on a single, eh, a regular income. So what I would do is, like, how about novel ideas, like, give them tax breaks, give them property tax breaks. If you're a senior, I think you get 10% right now. Well, how about making it actually significant? Eh, and if you've got, like, a kid, Okay, you get a 25% of your uh, your property tax. Two kids, 50. If you get four kids, you're not paying any property taxes. How about that? That's going to encourage people to get frisky at night. Thank you, appreciate that question. Um, I think that one of the things that we sometimes forget is that uh, more dense housing can actually decrease the impacts because if you have denser housing, you often get lower energy use. Um, you often get lower water use. So there are good things that can come from um, increased density. It can encourage more public transportation because you get to a certain threshold where public transit actually uh, becomes available. But you know, what I want to address is just this idea that, that you know, we can slow change. Um, change is happening. I have been in Boulder since 2005. Boy, has it changed a lot, <laughs> even in that time. Um, when my husband and I first moved here, uh, we were able to rent a one bedroom for about $850 that included utilities. It was beautiful, um, had underground parking. Um, it, was, it was wonderful. Um, I don't think you can find one bedroom in a house for $850 anymore, let alone your own unit. So um, it is happening. I look around my neighborhood in South Boulder. I have lived in my home in South Boulder for a little over 13 years at this point. Um, and I have seen so many homes in surrounding neighborhoods being uh, replaced, reasonable sized family homes being replaced by these giant homes that are twice as big, um, much more expensive homes. So that is a change we're seeing. Um, we are seeing in, in the time that I've been here almost two decades decades, we have seen a lot of uh, big companies replace our small businesses. It has been heartbreaking to see that downtown, to see how many small businesses that were, existed when I first arrived are now gone, replaced by these larger companies because the costs are so high here. Um, one of the other things we're seeing is fewer families. We are seeing a migration of families to um, East County where homes are more affordable. So that is another change that's happening. Um, and we are seeing a lot more wealth come into our community, which means our income gap, gap is growing. And I think it's not so much a question of do we want to slow growth or speed it up? It's really a question of what type of growth are we looking for? Um, and are we moving in the direction that we want to see? Thank you. <clears throat> I guess I'm I guess I'm chopped liver over here today. All right. <laughs> no worries. Um, well, the the technical answer to this one is impact fees. Uh, we actually have uh, impact fees that we assess on all new development, and this is for libraries, fire, transportation, um, to make sure that all new development actually does pay its own way. And on residential development, our impact fees are actually the highest allowed uh, by state law. So um, we do actually make sure 
that all new development pays into the funds that then go to improve our infrastructure and maintain our infrastructure. Um, so I'm proud that we have that. We have a long history in this area. Other communities will subsidize development. You know, they'll they'll pay millions of dollars to bring companies to town or to, to pay for the infrastructure for new development. We do not subsidize development. Instead, we impose uh, fees on those to make sure that it pays their own way. So other people have said good things about um, smart growth as well. It's part of our proud tradition here in Boulder. Um, and then the other thing is that when you do have new development, that you focus that new development in areas that have the services to, to sustain it. So where the trans, in transportation centers, where there's good walkability, bikeability, where there's good transit, where there's services nearby, right? So it's all part of making sure that our city stays in a kind of compact, sustainable urban form. And then just, uh, I'll just mention with, before the rest of my time, talking about the elephant in the room of the buffs, um, so if anybody's excited about the CSU game this weekend, this is going to be a big one. And I just have to mention, I have a friendly bet going on with uh, Mayor of Fort Collins, Jenny Arndt. We're best betting a case of beer uh, on the outcome of this, on this. And I look forward to uh, having a cold uh, Fort Collins brew uh, on her, uh, due to her uh, after the outcome of this very successful game, I'm sure. Okay, thank you for that. And Aaron, sorry, I almost passed over you. Um, please explain the ramifications of turning over the ownership of the library buildings to the library district. So, Paul, I'm sorry, this one's going to start with you. <laughs> well, you know, I voted against that. Hey, I couldn't really understand why we needed a, a library district. I mean, it's a great library. What a fantastic resource this is. And I don't know why they thought they could improve it by, I don't know, creating more red tape, but I guess that's what government does. That's all I'm going to say about that. And uh, Nicole, it's going to you. I did just want to bring in, oh, sorry. I did just want to bring in a second part of a separate question, but I think it's related, which is um, when are we going to see a decrease in budget proportional to the property tax decrease or new services anyway library district writ large that last question i'll read it to you okay. you can answer both i apologize paul i should have given you this one too when the library budget passed there should have been a reduction in the city budget i think what they mean is the library district passed there should have been a reduction instead of a big tax increase what can be done so people aren't priced out due to property tax increases but i consider these both to be library district questions um so the buildings and the taxes library district Okay, all the things. Yeah. Library district. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'll try to focus on it. Um, so I, I was somebody who was supporting um, this move to a library district. Uh, it was something where um, petitioners were asking voters to increase property taxes to form this library district, which is very common um, all across Colorado. There are over 50 of them in our state. It is a move that is uh, more and more are making. Um, this library district is governed by uh, a board that um, Aaron and I served on the selection committee for um, and that all of our colleagues uh, approved, uh, a board of trustees. Um, it, it has expanded the number of people who are supporting the library. So about a third of library users actually live outside the city of Boulder. Um, and some of the things in the library uh, department, or library's strategic plan um, five plus years ago, one of the things that we set in place at that point was to move toward a library district because it is a more sustainable model of funding the library. Um, as far as the buildings, um, the main thing I just want is for the library district to have control over the buildings. I don't want the city to be responsible for maintaining those buildings um, anymore. I really would like the district to fold that into their budget. Um, and I think that the district, we put really good trustees on that board. Um, I think that they should be empowered to make the decisions that they feel are best for the library district in the same way that we on council make the decisions that we feel are best for the city. Um, so uh, I think one of the benefits is just kind of better maintenance um, of the facilities. Our facilities strategic plan actually <laughs> wants us to reduce the number of buildings that we have and need to maintain because those costs are kind of escalating. Uh, as far as the library budget goes, um, one of the things we're looking at for this next budget, there's actually a reduction um, in what we're expecting to bring in for sales tax revenue, um, which is part of the reason why uh, we are needing to um, 
to use some of the funding from the library district to fund some of the other initiatives we put in place, like the day center, uh, the mental health first um, responder team, and, and some of those things. So it's, it's really, you know, in future years, maybe if we have more sales tax, we'll have more, but right, right now we don't. Aaron, all things library district, but buildings most important. Okay. Well, good. Well, I was a supporter of this effort as well. And fundamentally, it was about aligning the funders of the system with the users of the system. So before the library district was formed, the city of Boulder paid 100% of the operating costs for the library, but only uh, had two-thirds of the users. So those of us who were Boulder residents were subsidizing people from outside of the city who were using the, the library system. Uh, with the library district, now about 95% of the people who use the library are going to be funding it through property taxes. So we're getting a significant funding boost from those county residents uh, to help pay for the resources that we're all using. So I'm happy about that. It did, um, w the library district coming online did result in a slight property tax decrease. So there's a little bit of a savings that went along with the uh, library district going into effect. Uh, we do have some additional budget um, in this next year. We're actually talking about our budget at this Thursday's meeting. And so we are able to support some additional important initiatives, such as the um, new emergency response program that's going to send, a, a send out an EMT and a social worker to deal with some of the problematic cases that we see in town that aren't life safety cases, but are uh, people experiencing behavioral health crises. I'm excited about that program. There are other ones that will be supported as well. In terms of the buildings, we're actually talking about that this Thursday as well. I mean, we're not necessarily um, changing ownership of the buildings. We'll be discussing that on Thursday. I think it can work out perfectly well as a lease responsibility as well, where this, as long as the library district is maintaining the facilities, because they have the budget now to maintain the facilities. And the wonderful thing about the library district coming online is it means that the libraries, for the first time in decades, actually have the funding they need to catch up on deferred maintenance, to open the North Boulder Library branch, to open a gun barrel branch, which people have been desperate for for many, many years. So the library system is something that we're already proud of, but it's going to get even better. And it's a group that's dedicated solely to the health of the library. So it's not that we're giving this away to some other entity or leasing it to some other entity that's totally foreign. It's a group that's solely dedicated to improving our libraries. Thanks. First of all, I want to go back to Paul's really interesting idea about property taxes going down depending on family size. I'm, I'm one of seven children. I think my parents would have voted for Paul. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, was, I was opposed. Some, I know some of you voted in favor of it. Some of you voted against it. But a decision has been made to form a library district, which is a new legal entity, new government entity out there. I was opposed. I led, I led the, the opposition campaign. We lost. Um, and uh, so your taxes just went up by $19 million. Sorry about that. Um, but that was a decision the voters made. The decision we now have to make, the city council now has to make, as, as Aaron mentioned, we're going to make it tomorrow night, so tune in, is whether we should give away the building, this beautiful building, and the other branch libraries. Um, the district was formed, it raised your taxes by $19 million. But what was not decided by the people is who shall own the buildings. Should we lease this building to the, this new government entity, this new organization, it's kind of like the school district or RTD, now it's called the library district. Should we lease it to them for a dollar a year, which I'm perfectly happy to do, or should we give them the buildings? This is a building that you paid for, and the branch buildings are buildings that you paid for. Should we give it away to them? And by the way, if we do give it away to them, uh, if, to them, what happens if they go out and they said they're gonna do this, they go out and borrow money and put a mortgage on the building? What if they don't pay that mortgage? What if they file bankruptcy? What if they have other debt against them? Guess what happens to the building? It's gone. It's gone. So let's hang on. The one thing that we can hang on to is the building. Let's lease it to the library district for a dollar a year. If they're successful, which I hope they will be, then they'll be doing, doing just fine. If they're unsuccessful, we can take the building back. Thank you, Bob. And I think I was a little unfair to Paul. I didn't ask the second part of the question. Do you have anything you want to add to any of that? Okay. You can hold on to that. Give it to Nicole. She'll start the next one. Hang on. Let me get this question up. Okay. I'm trying to pick between these, um, but I think I'm going to pick the one that has the most interest. Um, managed encampments is the topic. Should a campsite with services be set up? Assuming yes, then where should it be located? And then, okay, yeah, that's the question. So do you believe in managed encampments? And if so, where should they be? Thank you for that question. Um, that is such a good, <laughs> it's a good way of phrase it. Do I believe in managed encampments? Um, I think it really depends on what, what outcome we're looking for. 
Um, if we are looking for something that is going to get people into permanent supportive housing, no, I don't believe in uh, managed encampments for that reason. Um, if we are looking at getting people out of our public spaces and reducing crime, yes. Yes, I do believe in managed encampments. So I think the goal really matters in, in what it is that we're trying to do. Um, I, you know, we cannot get all the housing that we need uh, right away. And, and I think having um, some sort of managed spaces um, could be a, a good way of getting people off of our creek paths um, and public spaces uh, because <laughs> we, we are housing, uh, housing people um, in jails if, if, if we don't. And I would really prefer that our um, police budgets be freed up for things like um, dealing with the bike theft. Uh, my son just had a bike stolen <laughs> uh, a month or two ago. That was his primary way of getting around town and his bike was stolen. Um, so I, I think that you know, if, if we're looking for getting people out of public spaces, if we're looking for crime reduction, Denver has seen success with this. The areas around the couple of safe outdoor spaces they have set up have seen reductions in crime, reductions in police calls to the area. Um, in my mind, that is a good thing uh, if, that's, if that is what our primary goal is. Um, so that our, uh, uh, maybe two years ago, our Housing Advisory Board and Human Relations Commission came together to draft some white papers on what we could do to uh, deal with what was then a growing encampment issue. Um, and a couple of the things they came up with were um, safe parking spaces as well as tiny home communities. And I think we can define what a tiny home is in so many different <laughs> ways, but the idea is to have very small six to eight person, little micro communities, kind of like what Denver um, is doing, set up around town. I would really love for it not to burden any one neighborhood. So I don't want a 40 to 50 person space in one neighborhood. We need to distribute, thank you. Yeah, so I'm interested in a form of this. Sometimes when people talk about a managed encampment, they're envisioning like an encampment that you might have seen along the creek and you just take that and you stick it in a parking lot somewhere and, and just let it kind of run. And I don't think that's a good idea. I mean, some other cities have said, sure, just like here's an area, bring your own tent, we'll see how it goes. And those have been pretty much universally unsuccessful. But there are models here that really have succeeded and we don't need to look any further than Denver here with the safe outdoor spaces that they've done. And this is what, something where they have a, an, an area where tents are set up. They're very high quality ice fishing tents with heaters. They have shared bathroom and kitchen facilities. And there are rules about um, behaviors and, and what you need to do in order to, to live there. And so those have been uh, stood up quite quickly and at a low cost and have been successful ways to get people off of unregulated areas, you know, along creeks or sidewalks or things like that and into a place where they can be safe, have their own space, um, and be um, continue on that journey to, to being housed in something more permanent. So I think that's a really successful model that is worth looking at here, because it is a quicker and easier way of getting people off the streets while we look for those more permanent housing solutions. So I think that needs to be part of our spectrum of solutions here in town. In terms of where, we actually did an inventory a few years back um, five years ago or so about where are there places in town where we could do something like that, like a tiny home village or like this. And there were a few that were located that are um, that on city owned land. So that in East Boulder, for example, the city owns some land in East Boulder uh, where our facility services center are that has room for something like this. We also p could potentially partner with a faith community to use some of their pro um, property to do something like this. And we've had some interest from faith communities in the past in this kind of thing. So I think it's worth being part of our spectrum of solutions. Thanks. The answer is no, I'm not in favor of a sanctioned campground. Our shelter has 33 unused beds each night. The people who are out here camping are not camping because there's no place for them to go. They're out there and they don't go to the shelter because the shelter has rules. No violence, no guns, no drug consumption per night. A sanctioned campground would have the same set of rules, right? We don't want to turn into a Mad Max situation. We would have the same set of rules. Do you think the people who don't go to the shelter because of those rules are suddenly going to go to a sanctioned campground where they have the same rules? The answer is no. I've talked to many, many mayors around the country who've experimented with sanctioned campgrounds, and each one of them has told me the same thing. Don't do it. It's a mistake. It's a horrible idea. Many of these cities have tried sanctioned campgrounds, have realized they're horrible ideas. It actually draws more campers to their city because the word gets out that this is a camping-friendly place and they have ended these sanctioned campgrounds. I suspect Denver will as well. God bless Denver for taking a sanctioned campground. I hope some of our people go down to Denver uh, if they're welcome to, to be down there. But I would say that it's a very, very bad idea. We've seen city after city after city try it and abandon it. I don't want Boulder to make the same mistake. 
Thank you, Bob. Paul. Yeah, Denver's just 30 miles. Just down the road there. And I was reading the paper, it's the number four destination eh, for transients. Top one's been New York, LA, San Francisco, and then Denver, just down there. So yeah, it's a big attraction there. I wouldn't say that's a success. That's not really a statistic that I would sort of measure as a sign of success of a city. Would I have a camps here? I don't know. I wouldn't just discount it because I'd be tough around here. It's like, you can't stay here. I'm, I'm going to enforce the illegal camping ban and you can't stay here. Well, people have to go somewhere. And it's just like, okay, you can go to these lovely camps that we've set up for you with these lovely porta potties. You can enjoy, enjoy that, you know, and if you don't like it, that's fine. You can just like, you know, move on or go home, but anyway, you can't stay here. All right, well, thank you, Paul. And I think that brings us to the end of our time. So I want to take a moment and thank the Boulder Newcomers Club for hosting this and our candidates for showing up. Thank you all. <laughs> I want to give a special heartfelt thanks to each of you for running. I know how hard this work is that you're doing to be in front of people and to get your ideas in front of them and to have a good conversation and be civil to everyone. So the candidates are working very hard and I'm glad you got a chance to meet them. If you heard something you like or have questions about, talk to them and please vote. Tell all your friends the election's coming up and uh, the boat's coming up, and I'll turn it over to Mike for any closing from the Boulder Newcomers Club, you but said, thank you all. You said it very well. Mike, I mean, Mike, 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 grab a mic. <laughs> okay. Um, Sam, you said it very well. Um, the four of you are um, doing quite a, a yeoman's job in, in just trying to represent the people and spending your time running for office, so God bless. Sam, thank you for um, not even working for minimum wage <laughs> and agreeing, he, he's agreed to, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the, uh, the forum, to uh, have another session for the club um, discussing the, the first time that we are uh, voting for mayor and the rank choice uh, process which uh, can be a little daunting. So Sam will, will help with that and spread the word to uh, other members. Bill, uh, thank you for recording this. Uh, Bill is gonna make it available so that the other 300 plus members of the club can see it. I think it's gonna be on a landing page on your website. Is that how we're doing that? <laughs> and it was good no and and thank you all and uh, enjoy the afternoon